Turn in the scriptures, please, this evening to a verse we've been looking at for some weeks now in Psalms, Psalm 55 and 22. Read it out loud with me, please. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain you. Glory to God. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and what will happen? Do you believe this is the word of the Lord? Can you count on Him to do what He told you He would do? We don't need to work on God's part. He's faithful. If He told you He'd do something, you can count on it. But it doesn't start off with he shall sustain you. It starts off with what? Cast your burden on the Lord. Whose part is that? That's our part. How many think if we work on our part, you don't have to be concerned about his part. He's going to do what he said he would do. So we don't need to be, you know, yelling and screaming, oh God, please sustain me. Please sustain me. Please sustain me. Is he going to change his word for us? What would he tell us? Would he tell us the same thing he said way back then? He'd say, well, cast your burden on me and I will. (laughs) There's a lot of praying that's vain, futile, because it contradicts the word. How can the Lord answer a prayer that contradicts what he's already told you? Now that's a thought worth meditating on, right? How can he answer a prayer? No matter how sincere you are when you pray. I don't care if you fast two weeks and pray six hours a day about it. How can he contradict what he's already told you? You know, as pastors, uh, Phyllis and I have encountered this not once or twice. I guess scores of times, maybe hundreds of times. People come and and they have problems and they need help. And we take these things seriously, whether it's personally or through somebody else. We seek the Lord and ask, not just assuming. It's not our opinion that will make you free. But His Word will. And how many know the Spirit of God, if you'll ask Him and look to Him, He'll give you exactly what you need to hear and know and do for that situation. Won't He? He will. And so, like I said, I don't mean five or ten times, I don't know how many times, that we've done that. We've asked the Lord, and He gave us something, and we gave it to them. And sometimes, uh, days later, weeks later, months later, They come back, still got a problem, and you ask them, did you do what we told you the Lord said? Well, no. (laughs) Well, they want something different. So now is the Lord going to change what he's already told us? So just scratch that. I know I told you that, but I see you don't want to do that, so... I don't know at the times that, you know, people have gotten frustrated with us, but we said, hey, if if the Lord really said that, how can I change it? Huh? If he he really gave us that, how can I say, well, let's do something else? Huh? And how is something going to be okay if you don't do what he told you to do? Hmm? What did the Lord tell us to do on this verse? Well, what if you just can't seem to bring yourself to do that? You just continue to worry. You continue to fret. You continue to be upset. Hmm? And you say, please, God, help me. Sustain me. Please, God, get me through. He's already told you something. (laughs) Right? If you don't do what he told you to do, then you're stuck. Because how can he ignore what he's already told you? 
How many believe God's Word matters in this universe? When He says something, He sees the end from the beginning, and it's never going to need modifying or changing, right? So when He tells you something, it was the answer 2,000 years ago, it'll still be the answer 100,000 years from now. Is that right? And if you ignore it and don't pay attention to it, you put yourself in an untenable situation, a situation where he can't help you, he can't change what he's already said, and you're stuck. How many think we need to do whatever he said? It's, it's the key to miracles. You remember at the wedding feast of Canaan? When uh, Jesus' mother turned and told him, whatever he says to you, do it. And they did, and the water changed to wine. Now that's something changing on a molecular level. Right? How could that be? It's a miracle. It's, it's, It's overriding, or I don't know what all he did to make it happen, but you're no longer limited by natural things. Hallelujah. If water could change to wine, that kind of molecular thing, disease tissue. Huh? Diseased blood cells. Is that right? Could change into healthy blood cells. What's the key? Begging God. Begging God. No, the key is not begging God. The key is hearing from Him and come on, help me out. Help. Then what? Doing what he said to do. And as surely as you do what he said to do, the moment you step out to do it, the power of God is going to come to confirm his word. His word is always confirmed when people believe it enough to act on it. Come on, somebody said out loud, I'm not a forgetful hearer. I'm not a hearer only. I don't disrespect nor ignore what he tells me. I'm a doer. I'm a doer. I'm a doer of the Word of God. Now, friend, that's the people that get results. That's the people that get miracles is the ones that do it. So in order to be sustained, he gave us direction, cast your burden on the Lord. Whatever's weighing down on you, whatever's pressing you, you've got to get rid of it. You've got to get it off of you and get it on Him and don't say you can't. That's a lie. That's just not true. Well, I, yeah, but it, it's, it's my baby. It's my, it's my daughter. It's my son. It's my grandkid. I, I, I can't help but worry. That's a lie. That's a lie. Come on, ask yourself, how are you helping them? By worrying about this. Hmm? How is it going to ever benefit them? I mean you can pull all your hair out. And not get any sleep. And and ruin your health. And it will not benefit them. Any. At all. Ever. But you could get in faith. And that would open the door. For somebody who can do something about it. But as long as you got it. And you're letting it sit on you. You're not casting the burden on him. How many know this is not the only place you'll find this? You'll find this, be careful for nothing. Right? Casting all your care on him. Philippians, 1 Peter, uh, Matthew 6. uh, Take no thought for the morrow. I mean, it's all through the word of God. What? It's a choice. Hmm? To say, I'm going to quit being scared. I'm going to quit being worried. I'm going to stop fretting. Here, Lord. You are well able to take care of this. I'm throwing this off of me onto you. And I'm just going to rest in you. I'm going to rest in you. When you really do this, people will think something's wrong with you. They'll look at you and you seem to be happy. You seem to not have anything weighing on your mind. Some of them will shake their head and say, poor dear. They don't realize what a mess they're in. Look at them. Carefree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in faith, doing what the Lord told me to do, acknowledging I couldn't fix it. I got to get it to somebody who can. And if I got it, he doesn't have it. If he's got it, I don't have it. (laughs) No, 
Worrying is not a good thing. It doesn't show how much you care. It shows how much you don't believe. Hmm? Now I know that's contrary to a whole bunch of religious tradition. I heard that old uh, cow moo. Right then, did you hear when I poked it? Woo! <laughs> but we don't need to poke it. We need to knock it in the head. Is that right? And get rid of all this unbelieving junk that's holding people back from getting answers. Somebody say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Cast my burden on the Lord and he will sustain me. Now go with me to the 91st Psalm, which is, some people refer to it as the protection psalm, but actually you could call it the psalm of being sustained. In Psalm 91 verse 1, he said, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And if you read through the whole psalm, you see the psalmist referring to that the arrow that was flying in the daytime didn't hit him. Amen. Hallelujah. The plague that was going through the community didn't even come in his house. Is that right? Thing after thing after thing after thing, he was protected, he was kept, he was spared. Does it sound like being sustained? And if you skip down to the end of the psalm, Verse 16, he said, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Another translation said, I'll show him how I can save. How did you make it to long life? How did the psalmist make it to a long life? The arrow didn't get him. The plague didn't get him. Is that right? The pestilence didn't get him. On and on, he was kept. He was protected. He was spared. That's how you make it over the course of your whole life until you reach old age. Huh? Disease didn't take you. Accidents didn't get you. Crime didn't take you out. Come on, are y'all with me? You were kept. Hallelujah. You were kept. First Peter talks about this. You don't have to turn there, but they'll put it up on the screen for us. First Peter tells us how we're kept. First Peter 1 and 5. First Peter 1 and 5 says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We're kept not just by one thing, not just by the power of God, but by our faith in Him keeping us. The power of God is able to keep us because we're trusting in Him. Right. Now the truth is, the reality of this world is that millions of people, including a lot of Christians, are not being kept. And they're not kept over the course of a full lifespan. Many people, many, are dying young, and they're dying wrong. Did you know the scriptures reveal there's a right uh, season to go and there's a wrong season to go. There's a right way to go and there's a wrong way to go. This concept of, well, everybody's got time to die and they think that means 945 on a Tuesday. And when your number's up, whew, you're out of here no matter what. That's not true. I said, that's not true. The Bible talks about things you can do that will shorten your days, cut them in half. The Bible talks about things that will lengthen your days and multiply your days. And it's not all up to God. And if that sounds new to you, don't just say, well, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with you, preacher. Uh, I'm not talking about what I came up with. I'm talking about verses. Hmm? Put your nose in the book. No. No. What we do, the decisions we make. And how many believe that God's a good God? He, if it was up to Him and only up to Him, He'd keep everybody. You believe that? 
We don't have to wonder, did he not say he is not willing that any should perish? Did he say it? And many other verses like this. God is not willing or it's not his will that any should perish. Is, are there any that are perishing? Yeah. Well, then obviously, just because it's the will of God does not mean it's automatically done. Now, if some of these things sound strange to you or new to you, uh, we got, we've, there are times that we've camped on this for months at a time, you know, talking about teaching on it once a week or so, um, the series You Choose. We went into great detail. You can get these. It won't cost you anything. Go back in the back, get online, download it, and go through all the scriptures with us. And, and forget about if you think you agree with me or not. Just go through the scriptures. See what the Lord says to you. No. The Lord told us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, if his will has already been done completely, why pray that it would be? There's so many things that people, that are preached in churches. It's just not right. It's just not true. We have a free will. And what we choose affects our life. And our kids. And our grandkids. Our choices affect and the Lord will let us choose and do things that take us completely out of his will and out of his plan. It doesn't please him. It's not his will. But if he makes us do it anyway, then we don't really have a free will. That's right. That's right. And we do have a free will. Yes. We do. He will, he will allow you to choose to do things that absolutely grieve him. But smart people, like I'm with tonight, <laughs> don't do that. They choose to please Him. They choose His will. They choose His plan. And in so doing, that allows Him to keep them on a level above other people. God is keeping people on the planet, some people, more completely than others. And it's not because he plays favorites. It's because some are doing what he said, trusting him, right? And others are not. I choose to be one of the ones that, that does, don't you? We've already covered a lot of ground on this subject so if this is your first time with us, please uh, take advantage of the materials that are available. Like, again, like we said, it won't cost you anything, no charge. But let's go on further. L last week, we uh, went in to some detail about how God commanded the prophet to go to the creek bank that he had commanded the ravens to feed him. Can God keep you in any situation? Yes, He can. But we kept reading there, and what is it, 1 Kings 17? We kept reading. He said, uh, I, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. How many think there is an important word in this thing? <laughs> Those ravens are getting food from I suppose various places. <laughs> and I doubt that people gave it to them. <laughs> but them having no concept of a law or breaking any law or rules, it just, uh, it was there, they got it. <laughs> but the amazing thing is that they didn't just go to hop over to the closest tree and eat it all. Right? But the Bible said God had commanded them. Uh -huh. oh, wow. Yeah. You know, if a raven could hear from God, yeah. if a crow could hear from God, you would think blood-bought, Holy Ghost-filled people of God could hear from God too. You know, people get all indignant and go, can you imagine? He thinks he's hearing from God. <laughs> uh, 
like one fellow said, you know, people were upset with him because he said the Lord told him this, the Lord told him that. They said, I don't believe all these people hearing from God. That, that bothers me. He said, well, it's all these people who never hear from God. Yeah. Bothers me. Yeah. We're not talking about hearing audible voices. We're not talking about seeing something. But didn't the Bible say the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit? Yeah that we're the children of God. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. If the Holy Spirit could let you know that you're a child of God, why couldn't He let you know something else? Well, He can. And He does. It's, it's a matter of learning how to listen. Learning how to pay attention. This is available to every believer. Every child of God. But those ravens responded to the command of God. And they flew Him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. <laughs> Droughts on throughout the country. And this boy is getting two good meals every day by the creek bank. He's got good fresh water. He's got bread. He's got meat. And then after a while the creek dried up and the Lord said go to the city of Zarephath. I have commanded a widow to sustain you there. Wow. A widow. And when he shows up in Zarephath, how many understand if he decided to go to another town, would he have met with the same success? Now we're still talking about when the Lord tells you something, you can't ignore it and do something else and have all your needs met. Uh, one of my nephews was in, uh, Mom, what did he do, two or three tours to Iraq? Yeah. And he was one of the guys that was with the bunch that went in nighttime. And, and uh, one of his jobs was get to the place, get up on the roof and secure communications. They could call in strikes. I mean, a very hot job. Boots on the ground. And... Uh, we had uh, encouraged them to listen to these teachings. We got a series called Perfect Protection. It's about Psalm 91, the whole thing, and, and about being led. And it's emphasizing, it's not just praying a prayer, oh God, protect me. You got to learn how to listen to him. That's right. People say, pray for our troops. We should, but that's not the whole thing. No. That's that's right. Right. You need to learn how to hear from him. And listen to him because that's one of the big ways he protects you. That's right. And so he got a hold of some of these things. Thank God. And so he said one night, they blared through this place. It's in the nighttime. They got through this building and he's supposed to go up the stairs and get up there and set up his stuff. And so he's about to do it. Spirit of God checked him. Don't go. Don't go. Well, he's done this over and over. This is his training. But hallelujah, he stopped. <laughs> He just stop Now, put yourself there. How many know emotions, adrenaline is high? Is that right? Adrenaline is high. What would be the temptation? To just ignore that, right? We'll come to find out they stopped and the other guys stopped with him. And these guys were sitting up there with the barrels of guns pointed down the staircase. They're just waiting on somebody to come around that corner. And it didn't turn out that way. Hallelujah. They stopped. They went around the other way. He came home. Hallelujah. But see, if he had ignored that and just blared up the stair and been filled with lead, and people could have been upset and said, well, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. Why did God not protect my baby? It's, there's more than one side to this. Yes, let's pray. But let's also learn how to hear, how to listen, how to pay attention. How does he protect? One of the ways he protects you is by checking you. Don't go there. Don't do this. Wait. Wait right here five minutes. How many of that could save your life? That could save your life. But that part hadn't been talked about enough. People want to make it all up to God. It's not all up to God. We have a part. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Lord, 
for helping me to learn how to listen, learn how to pay attention. Well, anyway, this uh, widow woman came and uh, the man of God asked her for a drink of water and she went to get it. You can begin to see why the Lord sent them him there. Drought's on, famine's on. What would a lot of people have told you? I guess he's, he may be a stranger to her as far as I know. Well, they say, water? you got to be kidding me. You're asking for water? But she went to get him some. And then he says, how about bringing me a little bite to eat? <laughs> oh, man. That's uh, like asking for gold. Right? It's life. People are starving to death. And she said, I was gathering a few sticks to make, basically make our last meal. I got a handful of, of, of meal, flour. I got a little bit of oil. I was going to make a cake. Me and my boy was going to eat it. That's our last thing we got in the world. He said, that's fine. Make me a little cake first. <laughs> now, what would these uh, talk shows have done with that? <laughs> Preacher takes food out of starving child's mouth. <laughs> but what we uh, went into seeing is that Jesus referred to this. When he was on the earth, he said there were many widows in Israel during that drought and famine, and to none of them was Elijah sent except to this one. Now this is this, this truth that we're talking about were a lot of people, even God's people, perishing. What made this woman different? Hmm? When he asked for that cake, what'd she say? She went and did it. She brought him the cake. He told her, he said, For thus saith the Lord, the, the barrel of meal will not fail, and the cruise of oil will not fail. What does that mean? God's going to take care of you. God's going to sustain you. Can you see this same principle though? Cast your burden on the Lord and he'll take care of you. Hmm? Go to the creek and I'm going to, I'm going to feed you there. Right? Make the cake and take it back. I'm going to take care of you. Can you see? It's not just one side. Do what I tell you and I'm going to take care of you. Hmm? When Peter needed tax money. It didn't just fall out of the sky in his pocket. No. He said, what? Go fishing. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds strange to you, man. But whatever he says to you, just do it. Just do it in simple faith. Well, anyway, what was different about her? This widow woman. Remember what Jesus said? There were many widows in Israel in the time of that drought and famine, but to none of them was Elijah sent except this widow in Zarephath? Do you want to be, even if it's one of the few, one of the few that God can sustain like this in the midst of people not making it, not making it their full lifespan, not making it, not being adequately and abundantly provided for? In times of need, hard times in the country. Well, we need to be like her. Why didn't the Lord send him to, to any one of these other, I guess, hundreds or thousands of widows in Israel? God's people. Why didn't he send them to them? Well, we know without going, he, does he know people's hearts? Yes. Does he know the end from the beginning? Yes then we know that when the man of God would have showed up and asked for the bread, what would have happened? They, they, they wouldn't have, they'd have said, you're crazy. No. No. What was it about this woman? <laughs> Do you see what I'm talking about here? We, we've got to have this same quality that this woman had if we're going to get something different than what the most of the world is getting. Where 
millions won't listen and do it, we've got to be one that will. Hmm? I said, we've got to be one that will. And if we will, that opens the door for God to keep us on a level other people are not being kept. And to keep us through things that other people don't make it through. And to keep us for a period of time until we reach old age and run our whole race and finish our whole course where millions are not making it that far. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Right? If you do what he tells you to do. If you trust him enough. This woman, this widow woman, had a respect for the things of God, didn't she? That obviously a lot of people didn't have. Do you remember the time when the man of God was, he'd passed through a certain area and he would stay at these people's house and the woman there said, you know, this is a real man of God. Let's build him a place to stay. Remember that? And they built a place on their house and furnished it. Well, that costs money. I mean, today, would it cost money to build a room on your house and put all the furniture in there? Yeah. And when he came, and later on in her life, after God gave them the desire of their heart, which was a child, was there a time in their life when it looked like that child wasn't going to make it to adulthood? Right? And did they get a miracle? Come on, did they get a miracle? And that child made it through. Death itself. Hallelujah. Can God keep you through anything, yes. through everything? Yes. But I'm just saying again, she and her husband had a respect for the things of God that most people didn't have, which is why he's coming to their house and why they are investing, spending their own money to make things comfortable and easy. Most people will not do that. How many people do you know would use their own money, build a wing on their house for a traveling preacher to stay in once in a while? <laughs> huh? Now there's all kind of excuses why. But it all boils down to they're not going to do it. They wouldn't do it. And these same folks in a time of desperate need would not sow a seed. They're not going to do it. Which is why the Lord didn't send him to any of those many widows that were in Israel. Wouldn't have been any need to. They wouldn't have obeyed. They wouldn't have done it. The Lord knew that. But there was a woman over in Zarephath. <laughs> little town nobody cared about. Little woman nobody knew about. But God, hallelujah, who, who searches to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for people who's got a heart towards them. Come on, are you listening? He was scanning the planet. Did he have to use her? No, he can use ravens. I guess he could, the next phase of it, he could have done it with rabbits <laughs> or dogs, right? I mean, could he? If he could do it with a raven, he could do it with a turtle. <laughs> huh? I guess, how many, how many believe, or, or we can say we know, God could have done it 10,000 different ways without even using people. Could he? So why this woman? Hmm? Why this woman? The reason he dealt with the man of God to ask her about sowing that piece of bread is not just so the man of God can get a meal. He wants to have access to take care of this woman and her boy. That's what he had in mind the whole time. 
Because if you read the rest of the passage, what did it say? She and her house. Now we know she had that boy, but I guess it was her other relatives too, whatever she had. They ate for many days. Could God have fed Elijah without this woman? You know he could. But see, it's more to it than that. Oh, friend, when he deals with you to do something for somebody else, he's got you in mind. <laughs> he's thinking about you. He could take care of them 10,000 other ways without you involved. Oh, come on, do you see this, saints? He's doing this for you. He wants you to give him a right to do for you what is not happening for millions around the planet. Mm. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the Lord our good God. Hallelujah. Let me give you some more scripture for this. Matthew 6, don't have to turn there, you know it, many of you. 6.33, anybody remember what it says? Matthew 6.33 is the master key for God's prosperity. What do you do when you need something? Work on getting what you need. No, that's the world's way. That's walking beside way. When you need something, See if you can get somebody to get interested in helping you. That's the world's way. That's the walking beside way. What did Jesus say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not what you need. Not what you need. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. He just got through referring the previous verses to your clothes, to your food. We, we talk about the basic necessities of life. All these things will be added to you, not while you're trying to get them, while you're doing something for His. Oh, do you see the principle? Doing something for His. So we know without, you know, going into detail, we know all those widows that were in Israel, did God care about them? You know He did. Did He care about their kids? You know He did. But they wouldn't listen to him. Or else why is he to send, send him to them? They, they, they didn't have the respect for the things of God. And they didn't have the faith to part with something so precious. They wouldn't, they wouldn't open the door. Didn't the Bible say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Didn't he say that? If any man will open to me. So who's going to open the door? Is Jesus going to knock the door down? Is God going to knock the door down? He's not going to knock the door down. If he's going to be with you in there. In your situation. It'll be because you opened the door. And invited him in. He's not going to be there anyway. And so the Lord is looking for access into our lives. Our faith, our reverence in Him, our obedience to Him which proves our faith gives Him access. Hallelujah. People fight so much about tithing. And tithing is God trying to get to you. What did He say? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out on you. This is about you. A blessing that you won't have room to contain. And I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Hallelujah. And you'll be called blessed. You'll be called blessed. What's that about? What, what, is a, what does a window do? A window provides access. You open it up, something can come in, something can go out. 
Tithing is about honoring God and about giving God access to you, to your finances, to your life. Hallelujah. And when he tells you to sow something, to do something. It's, it's a, yeah, he's using you to meet their need, but he could use any uh, of millions of other folks to get it done. He could do it without a human being. We, we see this, right? So why you? Why now? He's trying to get to you. <laughs> he's trying to set you up just like he was endeavoring to set that widow woman up. Come, is it true? You know, Phyllis and I had the uh, opportunity to serve with Brother Kenneth Hagin Sr. And, and his wife, Miss Aretha Hagin, for years. And uh, we were actually out west to uh, California on a meeting. We had been with them probably 10 plus years at this time. Wound up being with them 20 years altogether. And uh, some pastors came and they had said, uh, they said, man, y'all are so blessed to get to help them. And on this particular day, we had had some challenges. <laughs> we had our ministry uh, back in uh, Broken Era, and a bunch of things were going on. We're not having our own meetings. We're not uh, receiving offerings for our ministry. We're there at our own expense, and uh, we're doing things just to help and to be a blessing. And my first thought was, okay. <laughs> We're blessed to get to help. I know that's right. I don't feel like it right now. But uh, it, somewhere or another, how many of we all got flesh? We all got flesh, right? And they're wonderful people, don't get me wrong. But hey, you know, a lot of things sound wonderful to talk about them. But when you actually put your feet on the ground and start doing it, it's a lot like work, yeah. right? And, and it can involve some sacrifice, and especially when it goes on year after year, and decade after decade. And, uh, and the Lord began to minister to me about it. And I said, I know it is. I know it is. I just, I, I know it by faith. I take it by faith. I know we're learning, and I know we're sowing. But now as the years have passed, and we, you know, they, they're both in heaven now for a few years, and and, and we're in ministry, and we're blessed, I look back and see, yeah, he did it for them, but he could have used any number of other people. Now, they had a lot of other people helping them too. I don't misunderstand that. But in addition to our part, he was allowing us to sow into some of the best ground on the planet. That ministry, everything that he sowed, is still producing huge fruit, hallelujah, every year. And it gave him a right to do things for our ministry. The churches, I mean, this church, it was just like instant popcorn. Boom, there's a church. Sarasota, same thing. Boom, there's a church. Not struggling for years and years and barely begin to see something kind of increase a little bit. No, the word production center and the word supply, all of this reaching and flowing, I believe part of it has to do with sowing seed. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and it was God favoring us, allowing us to be the ones to sow that precious seed in that precious ground at that particular time. He was setting us up. I said he was setting us up. He was setting us up. Why would he deal with you? Help them. Why would he deal with you? So into them. Times when it's not convenient. You know, every time the Lord's ever directed me to, to sow something, not once do I remember him asking, is, Keith, is this a good time? <laughs> Never. <laughs> he already knows what time it is. Right? <laughs> Keith, can you afford this right now? Never. Never. He already knows. And if he deals with a widow woman to give a portion of the last meal she's got on the earth, 
Is he trying to take anything away from her? No. What's he trying to do? Give me some access. Hmm? Let me in there. Let me in your life. Hmm? People say, well, God, come on in. <laughs> it's not how it works. Hmm? It's just empty talk if you won't do what he told you to do. How can he be just in keeping you through things that other people perished in? If you won't do and obey him any more than they would. He's got to have a reason for keeping you where others were not kept. Sustaining you through things and past things that others perished in. It's not about works. But it's about having enough confidence in him to do what he said. And that faith gives him access. How many remember in the New Testament the Bible talks about we access his grace by faith? In Ephesians, other places. Faith is the accessor. It gives us access to the grace. And grace means he's getting access to us. To do things for us. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Go to Revelation 3 and 10. Book of Revelation 3 and 10. They, they got it up on the screen for us. I tell you, back up to 7. Verse 7, let's get a little bit a better uh, understanding of what he's talking about. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia right? So this is to the church. We're part of the church. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. When God does something, he's bigger than men. For you have a little strength, and you have what? You have what? You have what? You have what? You've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. Keep going. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I'll make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. My. Verse 10. Because, he says it again. Because you have kept the word of my patience. That's twice now. He says, you kept my word. What does it mean you kept my word? You did what I told you to do. You held on to it. You wouldn't let it go, and you obeyed it. Because you've kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. You keep reading the passages, you see about judgment, judgment, judgment that's coming on. And what's he saying? You're not going to go through that judgment. I'm going to keep you. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to keep you from that hour of trial and temptation and test and judgment. Why? Come on, help me, saints. Why? Why? Because you kept what I told you to keep. We saw this beginning in the, in the beginning, in Genesis. As long as Adam and Eve kept what he gave them to keep, he kept them in perfection. He told Adam, you keep this, you guard this. But when the enemy came and he failed to keep what God had charged him to keep, God could no longer keep them. Hmm? And they fell. And they were kicked out of the beautiful garden. What if he had kept the garden like the Lord told him to keep? Well, he could have continued keeping them. We must keep what the Lord gives us to keep pertaining to his things. See, God charged that widow woman, she's supposed to help keep this man of God. Is that right? And she did, and it gave God to do the right to do something for her that thousands of people were not getting among God's own people. He was able to keep her and keep her boy and keep her immediate family, the Bible said, many days. Why? 
she took a step of faith to help keep the man of God. This was her charge. God had commanded her. How many think those ravens made it pretty good through the uh, famine too? <laughs> There's probably a lot of ravens didn't make it, but how many think those ravens <laughs> made it through the drought? You know, we had a great revelation last week. Do y'all remember that? We found out why those things sit up on the house and go, caw, caw, caw. Jesus revealed it. They don't have to work. They're laughing at us, having to go to work, having to pay bills. <laughs> I knew they were cutting up about something. You, you could tell there was attitude in it. Come on, can you tell? There's attitude in it. <laughs> They're like, ha, look at them working stiffs. Go on to your little job. What are we going to do? Nothing. <laughs> Laugh at you. And I'm still going to eat. Huh? God takes care of them. And it should be a sign and reminder to us that if God feeds them, we're going to eat. Is that right? We're going to eat. We're going to be clothed. We're going to be housed. But. Can you see this principle? In order to be kept through things that other people don't make it through, we have to be willing to keep what God gives us to keep. We have assignments in this life. Many have not acknowledged it. And it's one of the reasons they've, had, they've struggled so much. Every one of us has a place in the body of Christ. And God will assign us to help keep something, to help support something, hmm? to make sure that it's taken care of and that it's right. I'm talking about his things. And what, you know, he could have used somebody else. He could have used a million other people to do that. But what is this about? If you'll do it. I said, if you'll do it, it gives him a right. To just come on into your life, both barrels, come on, do y'all know what I'm talking about? And to keep you and sustain you, and when other people are losing your business, keep you in your business. When other people's kids are sick or perish, heal your babies. When you would have perished through this, keep you from that accident that would have taken you out. Come on. But what many have done, they don't have time for church. They don't have time for the things of God. They are completely unwilling to be a part, to try to help keep something and make it go. And God loves them. But if they won't help his things and, and won't be a part of it anymore than unbelievers, how can he allow them to perish and take care of these that have no more commitment than they? Wouldn't be fair. Wouldn't be just. I know we, we, I referred to the Hagans, and when uh, I arrived there at, uh, in Oklahoma at the school, I had only been there, this is 1981. I had only been there a few weeks. And the Spirit of God spoke to me. I was sitting in healing school. Brother Hagen was on the platform. I didn't know him at all. He didn't know me at all. I was sitting there. Young man, just as wet behind the ears as could be. Green. Whew. And the Lord gave me the direct. I didn't realize it, but he gave me the directive for the next 20 years of my life. I thought we were going one year to school and not finishing, but just getting some training and going back home to Mississippi. That's what I thought. Fully intended to do that. But at the end of the one year, we just had a check about it. Okay, we'll go too. <laughs> then we'll go. <laughs> Two turned into three and five and 10 and 20. But as I sit there just those few weeks, he's preaching, he's ministering. I'm, my life is being changed. I've only been there a few weeks, but man, I'm hearing things I've never heard before. I'm seeing things I've never, I'm getting answers. I'm my spirit, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize it, but my spirit's getting built up. My faith is growing and increasing. And the Lord gave me uh, just these, these words. Help Brother Hagen. 
help Brother Hagin. Three words. But I knew it was from him. I knew it was from him. I thought, well, he's got all these people around here. He's got all his staff. He's got all his employees. He's got, what can I do? I didn't have any money. I didn't have any, no contacts. I had some I had some canned foods and stuff that my mom had sent me out there with. And uh, I took them to him, and, and he said, hi, okay, thanks. And he was gone. And then I thought, well, I, I don't know what else I can do. <laughs> Help Brother Hagen. <laughs> now, why did he tell me that? And, and, and I'm, I told Phyllis that. Why did he tell me that? Could he, could he have used any of thousands of other people to do that same thing? Yeah. It's not just about Brother Hagin. He's trying to get to me. But he has no right to do things for me that are not done for everybody else unless I'm willing to do things that not everybody else is willing to do. And I didn't know how, but I made up my mind. I'm going to help him. He doesn't know me. But I, the Lord told me to help him. So I'm going to help him. So I prayed. I helped him preach. Hmm? I was on the front. I didn't let my mind wander. I'm there. If he's looking for a verse, I'm believing with him. He's going to find it. Amen. Yeah. I helped him preach best I knew how. <laughs> and when they said, we need volunteers before they finish the sentence. We need volunteers to sweep the floor. We need volunteers to set up the chairs. We need volunteers to greet people. We need volunteers. He said, help him. I can do that. Well, so they asked me to do more things. They asked me to do more things. Asked me to help out in the healing school. Asked me to teach in the school a few years later. I kept asking me, ask me, do this. Eventually it was go with us on the meetings. Drive the car. Tote my bag. Hold my coat. Huh? That's not by accident, is it? It was a place the Lord gave us to help. Then he gave us more ability to help. And eventually it was spiritual. We'd sing songs and do things and he'd get stirred up. And realize this is helping him spiritually. Oh, glory to God. And that took years to get to that place. But this is helping him. And then eventually there were times he'd say, preach on this, and I'd preach, and he's shouting at me. (laughs) What he's doing is some of the same things he preached to me is coming back through me back to him. Some of the same things. So no wonder he's excited about it. (laughs) God gave them to him. (laughs) He's hearing his own preaching coming back through me like a boomerang. But then he'd get stirred up and he'd go off on a thing that he hadn't been uh, necessarily thinking about and it helped come up to another level. And all the time, the Lord, he knows the end from the beginning. Does he know the end from the beginning? He knows the end from the beginning. He said, all right, Keith boy, that's good. That's going to give me a right to do this for you 25 years from now. That's great. All right, now I can do this 30 years from now. That's good. Okay, now I got a right. Hmm? Instead of you going down with this, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to bring you through it. I'm going to help you out. Hallelujah! And because I'm endeavoring, and I don't claim to have done it perfectly, but I'm endeavoring to keep what he charged me to keep. Help keep him doing what he needs to do. Oh, glory to God. It gave him a right to keep me To keep Phyllis. We didn't get divorced. We didn't die by some accident or some disease. We're still here and we're not just scraping by. We're flying by. Hallelujah. And we're going to pick up steam. That's not just for me and Phyllis. With everybody in the kingdom, everybody in the body of Christ, you have an assignment. There's a church you're supposed to help. There's ministry you're supposed to help. Come on, are y'all with me? Every, somebody say everybody. Everybody, every, reckon how many people are doing it. 
precious few, which is also why they're not being kept. God didn't have a right. Wouldn't be fair. Now I know not everybody likes that kind of message. But is it the Word of God? Do you see the principles in here? What was he saying to the church? This is not Old Testament. The book of Revelation. He was saying to that church. Did, did we read it? Look at it again. Revelation 3, 10. Are we a part of the same church that these guys are? Is this New Testament? We're, we're in the same situation as these guys. He said, the Lord's talking, because you have kept the word of my patience. And this is the second time in just a couple of verses he said that. We saw it a couple of verses earlier. You kept my word. Because you kept it. I'm going to keep you. Highly. Don't you like that? I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation and judgment that's coming on all the world. How many know when that happens, a lot of people in the world are not going to make it? Right? The judgment, the temptation, the trials. Do we need our eyes open to this? Do we, do we need a greater awareness of this? Do you believe what we've just, I believe the Spirit of God said it through me. Do you believe every one of us has assignments? There's somebody, something in the kingdom you're supposed to be helping. And don't think, well, I got nothing to offer. Yes, you do. I mean, when the Lord told me, help Brother Hagin, it really looked like I had nothing to offer. Nothing. And then I realized, I got an amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and every day, I, every day I was right on the front row. And I wasn't just there in the body. I was there. I was there. Hmm? If nobody else is hooked with him, he can't say nobody was hooked with him because I was hooked with him. Huh? I can do that. That didn't cost any money. I didn't have the money, but I can do that. I can do that. Hallelujah. And when they say we need this, I can do that. I can sweep. I can move a broom. I can set up a chair. I can say hi to people. How many understand if I hadn't done those first things, would I have been used to do the other things, the bigger things? No, you wouldn't. There's a lot of folks, they want something as long as it's on the platform. As long as it's something that they want to do. But that's not being faithful. That's not wanting to help. That's wanting to be seen. No. There is a principle. For God to keep you, you've got to keep what he gave you to keep. Hmm? I want you to stand on your feet right now. This is serious. I want us to pray and ask the Lord. There are many people... They're not clear on their assignment. And the truth is, many people, he already told you what to do. You didn't pay attention to it. You didn't take it seriously. But it's not too late. We're breathing. The world's turning. The Lord's still on the throne. How many want to be kept all the way? You want to be kept? You want to run your race, finish your course? do everything you're supposed to do. Why do we need to be kept? Why does the Lord need to, to keep our bodies strong and keep our minds sharp and keep plenty of money to us and, and, and keep the angels working and preparing the road so we can do what? Goof off? Act just like the world? No, it's so we can do our assignment. Right? What we're supposed to be doing. So close your eyes. Say it out loud, Father God. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you. Thank you that you want to keep me. You've already made provision for me to be completely kept throughout my entire life. Bringing me through every trial over every obstacle, over every test. But I acknowledge also, it's not all up to you. Even though it's your will, I have a part. I must keep 
what you give me to keep. That gives you a right to keep me where others fall. If you've shown me things that I didn't pay attention to, forgive me. And I ask you, show me again. What is my assignment? Where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be a part of in your work, in your things, in your kingdom? Who am I supposed to help? What am I supposed to be doing and willing to do? I ask for it. Show me, remind me, grace me to be strong and do it. I'm willing to be willing and I'm willing with your help to do it in Jesus' name. Just keep your eyes closed. This came up in my heart about this. Now, this is not uh, about you going to somebody and demanding that they give you a place. That's not this at all. You don't deal with people. You let God deal with them. This is about you being willing and making yourself available. And there's a number of folks that the Lord hadn't told to do certain things because it wouldn't have done any good. It's like all those widows that were in Israel. They wouldn't have done it anyway. So he didn't send the man of God to them. It begins not by you seeing and hearing something on the outside. It begins with an adjustment of heart. And when you're truly willing, some things will come to you. Some things will come your way. Because the Lord knows before you hear it whether you'll say yes or no. So tonight the big thing is be willing. Be willing. Say it out loud like the Master said. I delight to do your will, O God. No matter what. I'm not too busy for you. I don't have too much going on to do what you tell me to do. Not my will, but your will. Not my life, but the plan you have for my life. I choose to be willing, to be willing, to be willing and obedient to you. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord.